So we're here at uh, Balderton's headquarters in King's Cross, and we're here to talk to partner Rob Moffat uh, from Balderton's uh, about some of his perspectives and insights on what's happening in the venture capital world um, as we go into 2016. So hi, Rob. Hi. Slightly different tack. There's been um, quite a lot of uh, talk and uh, press about the, the amount of venture money um, that's been raised by organisations um, in Europe. Yeah. So the past 12 months. Yeah. Um, and the, the report particularly that I was looking at was the Dow Jones Ventures one, mm-hmm. which uh, I think quoted that the first three quarters in 2015 uh, mm-hmm. raised more than 9 billion euros yeah. um, in venture capital for companies, which is a staggering amount of money being invested by um, VCs into general yeah. business. And I guess they're not all tech businesses, but um, still a staggering amount <coughs> of money. Yeah. Uh, and a whopping 40% increase, I think, on 2014. Yeah. What, what's your view on why that's happened and what's your perspective going forward? Is that something so I think, that's going to yeah, continue? So I think the, the venture capital industry in Europe, playback to 2008, say, was fairly limited. There was a limited number of funds. Those funds had limited capital. Uh, and it was quite a constrained industry. Um, and also the supply of companies wasn't as strong. Uh, you fast forward now seven years to 2015, and um, there's a much stronger supply of good entrepreneurs. As a result, there's a lot more venture capital funding coming through. Um, I think what's really skewed the absolute number of dollars invested or euros invested is the some of these big mega rounds at the late stage. Uh, so Rocket Internet is the kind of the obvious one that people focus on that's raised billions of euros uh, for its various companies at late stage. Um, but a number of other companies as well raising these kind of big private mega rounds, hundreds of millions, um, because they want to go very fast because they don't want to go public or they can't go public. Um, and so they're going off and doing these big sort of private mega rounds. Are we getting to the full expansion of a bubble? Yeah. Um, what, what's your perspective going into 2016 of what that, what that looks like? Or is this going to be a controlled environment? So I think it's important to separate Europe and the US. If you look at the US, I think this sort of obsession with unicorns of billion dollar companies um, got a little bit out of hand last year. And there were some slightly irrational behavior going on in terms of valuations uh, and it became this real milestone entrepreneurs wanted to have and you'd have these rounds set up just to get to a billion dollar valuation because that was your badge of honor. Um, There was almost none of that in Europe. Um, I think there were some reasonably high valuations but nothing that I'd say was irrational. I think what you're now seeing in the US as of six months ago is I think the big venture capital firms um, and uh, I think sort of Bill Gurley at Benchmark leading the way on this, but other firms as well, really trying to deflate the bubble in an orderly fashion. These are guys who lived through the last bubble popping uh, and they yep. saw what it was like. And I think they can see it starting to reach, starting yep. to pick up in that way in the US and really trying to calm it down before it becomes a full on bubble and it pops. Um, and I think we're trying to do the same in Europe and make sure we stay rational um, while recognizing that the underlying conditions for success of companies have never been better. There's a great mm. supply of entrepreneurs, there's great support, there's great government support, there's plenty of funding. So you have all the right ingredients to build big companies. Yep. It's just not ruin it by getting too excited. And what does that mean? I mean, it sounds a little bit like some of the, the, the funding is geared more to the big investments from, mm. from the VC community. What, what do you think it means sort of down to the Series A round folk? And uh, yeah. you know, there's been this yeah. kind of gap, particularly you know, companies we bump into in London Mm. Um, who get through their, their sort of EIS, they get through their um, you know, um, early stage funding, family funding, that sort of stuff, and angel yeah. funding. But then there's that step towards Series A, yeah. which always seems to be a big step in, in many organizations. What's the, yeah. your perspective on, on how they address that and so I think, the challenge yeah. there? Today with a startup, there's so much that you can track and you can, there's so many numbers you can put on the startup. You can measure unit economics, you can measure acquisition costs you can come to a pretty clear view on whether there's a really viable business there or not. And I think investors, certainly at Series A, become quite demanding. They want you to have proven that your unit economics work, that your acquisition costs are sensible. Uh, And if you can't prove all of that, then they're a little bit worried, Um, which is good and bad. Uh, It's great that you can get to that level of certainty, but I think some businesses that need longer to prove um, sometimes struggle now because they're competing against other people who've got all the right numbers on a piece of paper. So one question I wanted to ask you as a, as a London-based VC, firstly yeah. at a country level, um, I mean, how much is your operation geared around startups and organisations that you're funding in London and how yeah. much visibility and how much potential do you get from other parts of the country and what, what yeah. does it mean for some of the guys that are startups 
um, who may be listening to this that are in other parts of the country, what, what advice would you give yeah. them? Yeah, so I think, yeah, as London-based, we, we strenuously try to not be too London biased. I think we're very aware of that. Um, and we want to invest across Europe. Uh, and you look back at what we do, it's probably 50% London and 50% everywhere else, which is probably not where it should be, but it's not that far off the actual level of activity uh, across different cities. So in the UK, I think we have investments in Manchester, we have invest, uh, investment in Scotland, um, investment in Bristol. So we have a couple of other investments across the rest of the UK. Uh, and then it's really spread across Europe. It's Berlin, just, it's just, Paris. Is that trend continuing from your side? Are you going to yeah, no, I think we'll say. Right? London, is, London is becoming incredibly expensive uh, for property. Um, salaries are becoming very expensive. And so, the, yeah, the law of a Berlin or a Manchester or a um, wherever it might be um, becomes much more attractive. I suppose the, um, the follow on question from that is this, this whole topic of um, the US. Mm -hmm. um, and whether you know eventually you know a very tech orientated startup from the UK mm. has to seek its fortune in the US um, because you tend to sort of get the impression there are higher valuations sometimes for some of the technology areas mm. uh, and we've seen you know some great examples the huddles the digital shadows those types of people mm -hmm. um, finally seek their fortune in the US which mm. in, a, in a way is a shame in the sense that it would be great if the next Cisco or the next Amazon was grown and invest, invented in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, what's your perspective on, on that side of things? I think a really, our view on that really varies by sector. So I think if we take consumer businesses, um, the gaming business like King or Supercell, they stayed in Europe and they became multi, multi billion dollar companies. Um, I think for any consumer business, you can start it anywhere now. Uh, as long as you can get enough talent and you can persuade them to come to Berlin or wherever it might be, then you can build a huge company. I think for software sales, I think sadly the reality is that the biggest market is the US, uh, a lot of your clients are in the US, um, your acquirers are in the US, the IPO market in the US is much more supportive uh, of software as a service IPOs, that there is that really strong draw to the US and given the number of factors involved it's hard to see a sort of way of avoiding that. Um, we're very open to that but I think the reality today is for most of our SaaS software companies as we do kind of encourage them to get to the US mm -hmm. um, at the right time for them. Is there any kind of bits of advice that you would offer for those that you know mm -hmm. are going after their first Series A round and things that uh, you see as a yeah. VC, the, the pros and the cons? So I think what's, what's changed over the last few years is the VC market is more competitive and growth and progress become more visible. Uh, there's so many ways, tools such as Matamark that allow people to track usage of software or usage of consumer products. Um, the app store rankings are very visible. So VCs are now feverishly tracking, looking for the impact of and who's growing. So that means for you as an entrepreneur is if you keep your head down and you're building a good business uh, and you're actually bringing in customers and bringing in users, the VCs are going to find you. Uh, and it's very much one well, of my colleagues, James, talks a lot about there is no funding round anymore. People are always raising and VCs are always chasing. And so if you're building a strong business and you have a growth curve that looks like this, then the VCs will be chasing you. Excellent. Thanks for your time, Rob. Thank you.